So now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, one of Rocky Mountain Map Society's founders, Wes Brown, also the treasurer, many roles. Wes has been a collector and student of old maps for over 40 years. He's published many papers and given scores of talks about the history of cartography. He serves on the board of our Rocky Mountain Map Society, also the Society for History of Discoveries and the International Map Collectors Society. Wes's deep knowledge of and enthusiasm for historical mapping of Colorado and the Mountain West is legendary. You can ask him any question, he'll be able to answer it. He's been very helpful in my library work too. And he's always working on unraveling a new historical mystery, including what you'll hear about in tonight's talk. So please enjoy. Thank you, Naomi. It is true that I love maps. I just love maps. And uh, I've got a few maps that I can't wait to tell you about. I'm going to try to share my screen. And off we go. Excellent. Can you see the screen? Got it. Yeah. OK. Claude de Lille, student of famous French map maker Nicolas Sanson, and a geographer for the French Royal Academy, produced mostly manuscript maps. His family, including his sons and sons-in-law, played a leading role in French cartography. One of his sons, Guillaume, was educated by Claude and later by the brilliant mathematician and astronomer Jean Dominique Cassini. Now. I'm a little different from Claude, from Guillaume, because I'd have never had the same hairstyle as my father. Uh, father Claude focused on gathering cutting edge geographical information, while his son Guillaume directed his energies to making the maps. Guillaume was so successful that by the young age of 27, in 1702, he became a member of the French Royal Academy of Sciences. In 1718, he received the special title of premier geographer to the king and was so renowned as to be visited by Peter the Great of Russia and the king of Sicily. Although Guillaume's name was usually the only de Lille name on the printed map, his father was an essential partner, at least during the time that I'm going to be speaking of the dates of my talk tonight. So if I use de Lille in the singular, I'm basically referring to both the father and to the son. So for my talk, I would like to discuss three cartographic treasures created by Guillaume and his father, the maps of North America of 1700, 1703, and 1718. However, I am going to begin the discussion with two earlier maps that are going to illustrate the geographical understanding of the geography of Western North America so that we can really better understand the great contributions that Delille's made. The first map we're going to discuss was made by the renowned Nicolas Sanson de Albeville. On the basis of rigorous research, Sanson produced superb maps, thereby earning his position as cartographer to the King of France and helping France become the dominant force in cartography for the next hundred years. This detailed map of, North Amer of the North American interior published in uh, 1656 by Sanson was a great leap forward in many respects, but I'm gonna only have time to emphasize a few that relate to our talk tonight. The land drained by the Mississippi River, then unknown, is shown with many rivers converging into the Rio de Espirito Santo, or the Bay of the Holy Spirit, first shown on a map in 1524, so much earlier. The rivers are limited by the arc of a mountain range to the north. The concept of this range resulted from Hernando de Soto's account of his expedition around 1540, in which he describes the many foothills that became known as the Appalachian Mountains. Sanson's mapping of the upper Rio Grande Valley and the region of New Mexico was revolutionary. On prior printed maps, the places that are shown in the region were essentially all mythical. But the reports from Father Benavides, who attempted to convert the Indians in the valley, allowed Sanson for the first time to illustrate authentic places on a printed map. Shown are new Spanish settlements 
established at the beginning of the century. We see Santa Fe, Taos, Socorro, for example. Also shown are numerous Indian Pueblos, uh, Hopi, Zuni, Akama. Uh, and for the first time, tribal names are present, notably Navajo and Apache. Now notice that as sharp as he is, he doesn't quite have the real ground noted as the real Del Norte, correct. He's got it draining into the Sea of California. Uh, but this is still a tremendous leap forward. Now, this leads us to Sanson's image of California, shown here as an island, which was customary after the 1620s. Now, before the 1620s, California had, gener had generally been illustrated as a peninsula, as this slide demonstrates. So how could such an amusing myth come about? And I'm giving you the condensed version tonight. California gets its name from ancient lore surrounding the island of Amazons and its warrior queen, Calafia. The Spanish exploratory voyage up the western coast of North America in 1602, led by Sebastian Vizcaino, was chronicled by Fray Antonio de la Ascension. Antonio, noting they saw no large rivers draining the land, surmised that the region could not be continental and therefore must be an island. Remarkably, a map drawn by Antonio was captured. It was showing the mistaken belief that California was an island and it was obtained as booty by a Dutch ship and taken back to Europe. So given earlier suspicions and armed with this seemingly informed account, European map makers began showing California as an island. Oxford professor Henry Briggs first popularized the myth of 1620 in 1625. This fantasy, laughable today, continued well into the 1700s. Now, the next map I want to show you is by Vincenzo Maria Cornelli, a Sicilian ecclesiastic who published 400 maps in his convent in Venice. His work was so highly regarded that he moved to France to work directly for King Louis XIV. Uh, and he made initially two spectacular large globes, manuscript loads, go, globes for the king from which then many maps uh, were derived. He was a member of the French Royal Academy of Science and later geographer to the king. So this great map of North America dated 1688 was drawn by Cornelli and was published by Jean-Baptiste Nolan, who's responsible for the beautiful artistic elements you see. It includes details about the interior of North America, first shown, shown by Cornelli in maps that he separately published with Nolan the year before. So there were two key maps, but they were not widely produced. And then the next year, this block rust, uh, buster uh, was brought out. Uh, this map was widely distributed and really presents the best cartographic image of North America, of the North American West. It was generally available to the European public at that time. So studying this map really sets us up and allows us to better understand the revolutionary publications by the Delilles that would follow. Cornelli's map celebrates the exploration of Cavalier de la Salle, who in 1682 traveled the length of the Mississippi, proving that it emptied into the Gulf of Mexico. Now this feat together with the voyages of Joliet and Marquette nine years earlier are noted on the map in legends along the river. Upon their, his arrival at the Gulf, La Salle claimed the region drained by the mighty river for his king, Louis XIV. Now you need to recall that he's traveled from the north, from the Great Lakes, down to the Gulf. By ap but after traveling hundreds of miles through twists and turns on the complex river, he had no idea where he was on the Gulf Coast. His longitude was a complete mystery, his latitude imprecisely measured. On the basis of this information, we can see Cornelli's early attempt at showing the Mississippi River. 
In doing so, he perpetuates a significant error of placing the outlet of the Mississippi 500 miles too far west, debouching just next to the Rio Grande. So this depiction requires significant lengthening of the Wisconsin, the Illinois, and the Ohio rivers out to the west so that they connect with the misplaced Mississippi. So how did this crazy error come about? Well, there are several possible explanations, and I've got time tonight to just give you a few of them. First, the early French explorers exaggerated the western reach of the Lake Superior and then located the upper Mississippi farther west from that point. So in the north, the Mississippi started out way too far to the west. Second, the Rio del Espirito Santo, the generally assumed outlet of the Great River, had been located in the western third of the Gold Coast, Gulf Coast on most maps for the previous century. Marquette and Joliet's 1673 exploration down the Mississippi ended at its junction with the Arkansas. They didn't go all the way to the Gulf because they feared attacks by hostile Indians or the Spanish further south. So consequently, they had to guess where the river came out. They assumed that the outlet of the Mississippi was the Rio del Espirito Santo. Thus, they naturally placed it in the Western Gulf. The third explanation is expressed by Professor Peter Wood, who has spoken to us before. The true latitude of the central Gulf Coast is 30 degrees and was generally accurately reflected as such on maps at that time, but without knowledge of the delta, which extends a full degree of latitude further south to 29 degrees. LaSalle had covered this extra degree of latitude to the south when he arrived at the Gulf. But when he determined his latitude that should have been 29 degrees, he obtained 27 degrees, owing to either a calculation error or by some faulty astrolabe, astrolabe. Because LaSalle believed that the mysterious outlet of the Mississippi must be at 27 degrees, he pushed his expected landing hundreds of miles to the west where the Gulf Coast bends southward so we could connect the 27 degrees to the land moving to the south. So that pushed it way to the west. And finally, by mistakenly placing the outlet too far west, LaSalle pleased his financial backers uh, by locating it near the anticipated silver mines of, of New Spain. So for these reasons, LaSalle located the Mississippi's outlet very far west. And as, as draftsman, his draftsman, his map maker, Jean-Baptiste Louise Franklin uh, illustrated. So Cornelli just followed LaSalle's mistaken assumption. As we discuss the Southwest, this image is important. Cornelli depicted previously unknown information from Don Diego de Penalosa who served as governor of New Mexico from 1661 to 1664. Peñalosa was banished from New Spain for outrageous conduct, which would be fun to discuss tonight, but I'm gonna move on. And, and he went to Europe to sell his firsthand geographical information to the French. Now, Coronelli exclaims his debt to Peñalosa in the lengthy title. The image of New Mexico includes many new settlements that survive to this day. Significantly, it reflects the generally mountainous terrain surrounding the upper Rio Grande, here labeled Rio del Norte. It was Rio del Norte in the north and Rio Bravo in the south at this time on maps. The Rio Grande is shown uh, draining due south to El Paso which is shown for the first time on the map he made the year before. So this is a very early rendition of, the, of El Paso. And then notice the Rio Grande bends to the east and properly goes into the Gulf. Now, Coronelli follows the norm showing California as an island, although he admits in the legend that it might be a peninsula. So now you've got this cartographic background. We're gonna put our attention on those, those maps of the Delils. 
In 1700, Guillaume, utilizing astronomical observations from the Royal Astronomy Observatory of Paris, produced his first printed maps in the form of an atlas. Those observations repositioned most of the continents more accurately than previous ones and revolutionized world geography. Guillaume's atlas contained a map of the world and continents, and it included a major map of North America. Now, although this map bears a decorative cartouche, we can see Guillaume's sparse style and comparatively simple tables and blank spaces uh, where precise information was absent. For example, the Northwest region of North America was above Cape Mendocino is completely blank. This was certainly not standard at this time in map making. First, so there are three important contributions that this map made, and I want to go through each of these in detail. First, it established the correct coordinates for the positioning of North America. Second, it positions the Mississippi River east of contemporary maps. And third, it suggests that California is not an island. Now, we just observed that Cornelli's prior maps had generally shown the newly discovered Mississippi approximately 500 miles west of its true location, entering the Gulf just above the Rio Grande at about 274 degrees. Claude de Lille, through his work with the French Royal Academy of Science, was charged with producing preparatory maps for the exploration of Pierre Lemoyne de Iberville. In exchange, de Lille was first to receive the cartographic results upon Iberville's return. So de Lille, therefore, had material from Iberville's voyage 1698, returning in 1699, which he used to create the first state of this map. And this image printed in early 1700 of the ultra rare first state of the de Lille's map shows they moved the Mississippi considerably eastward. We're just looking at a close up here. The outlet is indicated at 281 degrees. So he moved the Mississippi three degrees of latitude of longitude to the east. In a letter to Cassini, Claude de Seal explains that their rationale for moving the river eastward was based upon their reading of Leclerc's narrative of the La Salle travels and the writings of Father Louis Hennepin. During Iberville's second trip in 1699, so he comes back after the first trip, shares this information with de Lille, turns right around, goes right back uh, to do more in 1699. He establishes Fort Iberville, 18 leagues upriver from the Mississippi, uh, from the mouth of the Mississippi. Iberville returns to England in June of 1700, and De, De Leo was immediately made privy to these new reports. This cutting edge information was used by De Leo to produce a second state of the map in 1700 that you now see. The second state of the map shows important changes to the mouth of the Mississippi from the first printed first state printed just a few months before. The Mississippi Delta is added for the first time on a printed map. The word fort shows Iberville's new location on the Mississippi. You also see Fort Biloxi, which he had established the year before. The mouth of the river is moved even further, three more degrees, now to 284 degrees to the east. The De Leo suspected that California was attached to the mainland, although the generally held view at this time was that it was an island, as we've discussed. By showing the land at the head of the Gulf of California is very close to the mainland, the De Leo's led some historians to list this map as one of the very first in print to refute the myth of California's insularity but yet the land is not attached. De Leo's uncertainty is expressed in a letter written by Claude in 1700, after he inspected a manuscript map completed by Jesuit father Eusebio Quino in 1796. This map, whose rare image I really had to hunt 
and twist some arms to get this image. So none of you can copy this image. This image uh, is of a wonderful manuscript uh, that had been forwarded by Kino to the Royal Academy in Paris, which allowed de Lille, as the geographer of the French king, to see it. Now, at this point, Kino was still convinced of California's insularity, as shown on his map of the Southwest that illustrates his very advanced knowledge of the Pima Indian region. In a letter about Kino's map that clearly shows California as an island, this map, Claude notes, and I quote, nevertheless, the most cautious geographers hesitate to express their opinion as to its insula, insular or peninsular nature. So the Delios are clearly unsure. Directing our attention to the vast region of the Southwest, boldly titled Nouveau Mexique, we see the area of the upper Rio Grande is encircled with a faint dotted line that area is also named Nouveau-Mexique, probably referring to the administrative region of Spanish authority at that time. The place names are rather sparse and generally follow a 1660 map of Giovanni Battista Nicolosi. Nicolosi. So unlike Coronelli, and this is a surprise to me, De Leo fails to reflect the information of Peñalosa on this 1700 map. Now there's one other feature I'd like to bring to your attention. Notice that north of Taos, there's an east flowing river titled Rio de San Francisco, which perhaps reflects native knowledge of the headwaters of the Arkansas River. DeLeo connects this river with a dotted line to Pecatinone River, an early French name for the Missouri derived from Joliet and Marquette. Now thus, north of Santa Fe, north, north of Taos, the Rio de San Francisco is the headwaters of the Missouri with an exclamation point. This idea came from La Salle's writings and was supported by Franklin's maps. So we'll leave this map behind and go to this beauty. In 1703, the DeLille family published a stellar map of North America shedding new light on its western interior. The title of the map, Carte de Mexique et, uh, et de la Florida, announces that most of North America was controlled by the Spanish or the French. The English possessed the small region east of the Appalachian Mountains uh, from Carolina northward. Florida, the name for France's holdings at that time, expands far westward to control Louisiana and Texas with Iberville's new base on the lower Mississippi, intense exploration is undertaken during these first years, providing DeLille with information from many sources. For the upper Mississippi, Pierre Lesueur's exploration up the river as far as Minnesota was especially helpful. On the 1703 map, DeLille moves the Mississippi, river, uh, Mississippi River's outlet three more degrees to the east to 287 degrees. So let me repeat, he's now moved this three times. He moves it from the standard of Coronelli east on his first state of his 1700 map, three degrees. In his second state of his 1700 map, he moves it east three more degrees. And on the 1703 map, he moves it three more degrees as well. Now, DeLille used the Canary Island of Faro as his prime meridian, which was the standard for the French at this time. Converting this meridian to Greenwich prime meridian places the delta at 91 degrees west, just two degrees west from its correct position, which is an amazing feat of longitude calculation at that time. The map was first in print to convey significant new information about the Western tributaries to the Mississippi. It illustrates the Red and Arkansas rivers whose sources are far to the mysterious West and join the Mississippi with reasonable accuracy at their confluences. On this map, the position of the Missouri River is now quite different from the map created only three years earlier. The Leo 1703 map eliminates the error we discussed uh, on the 1700 map, 
where he connected the Rio de San Francisco above Taos to the Missouri. They are now separated by a great distance. On the earlier map, the Missouri went due west. Now it flows from far in the northwest. Along the Mississippi region is more detailed and accurate, uh, although the Mississippi region is more detailed and accurate on this map, the region that would become Texas is still crudely depicted. But farther west, unlike on Delio's 1700 map, the area of the upper Rio Grande now shows great resemblance to the manuscript map of Peñalosa, remarkably even more so than Coronelli's 1688 map that we discussed earlier. The map contains a few toponyms from the 16th century that I want to discuss. Cavira, the final object of Coronado's exhausting two-year expedition beginning in 1540, is placed in the far north of the map above Taos. Delio has moved it eastward from its usual placement near the west coast, at least somewhat closer to its actual location in what would become the state of Kansas. Below the Zuni Pueblos is the indication Zuni or, or Cibola. In 1539, a Franciscan priest named Marcos de Niza made a brief entrada to the north, seeking his uh, seeking the famed seven cities. On his return, the friar assured his superiors that he actually saw one of the great cities known as Cibola, well, at least from a distance, and understood that there were six other great cities. From this expedition, a key place name, Cibola, first appeared on a Gestaldi map of 1548. The place name Cibola is likely a Spanish corruption of Shawona, the Zuni word for themselves or their land. Thus, Delio continues the tradition within the phrase Zuni or Cibola that had appeared on maps for 155 years. Now, just above is Gran Tawayo Habitat Parla Tiguas. Now, Tiguex was originally the name given by Coronado Spaniards to the collection of pueblos near the upper Rio Grande from Taos south to Albuquerque. Some of his, spent, his men spent two winters there, so the winters of 1540, 1541 to 1542. But nothing was known about the area to the north. Tiguas, presumably a corruption of Tiguex, eventually referred to the Indian peoples living farther to the north. Tewayo is a general term for the region north and west of the upper Rio Grande, the Great Basin region of today. And I'm using a native pronunciation for that word. In the far Southwest, DeLeo makes full use of the 1696 manuscript of, of Father Kino that we discussed earlier, showing extensive and accurate toponyms in the area of the Pima in Southern Arizona, Sonora and Sinaloa. As to the theory that California is an island, DeLeo is still unsure. It would take Father Kino nine expeditions to the area around the mouth of the Colorado between 1698 and 1701 to provide evidence for him to produce his famous manuscript map of 1701, finally printed in 1705 that you see here that shows accurate detail of the area and boldly states in its title as translated, Overland Passage to California. Now, although DeLille did not have the benefit of Kino's manuscript before the publication of his 1703 map, he was early to accept Kino's work, but others were not so sure. Leading English map maker Herman Mall wrote in 1711, that California was surely an island. And I love this quote, quote, why I have had it have in my office, have had in my office mariners who have sailed round it, he said. Many European publishers continued selling maps showing California as an island, requiring King Ferdinand VII to issue a decree in 1747 that 
California is not an island. So this landmark map, first printed in 1703, was reprinted by De Leo in 1708 and 1722. After Guillaume's death, the map was printed by his widow and then by his son-in-law, Philip Bouache, and after that by his successors until, think how long this would be printed, until 1783, for 80 years. The map was copied by most other European publishers during the first half of the 18th century. When I think of Louisiana, the Saints football team doesn't come to my mind and neither does Mardi Gras. Instead, Delisle's famous 1718 map of Louisiana pops in my mind, as cartographically twisted as that might be. I just love this map and let me tell you why. As the years rolled on after 1703, the Delisle family continued to receive maps and journals of explorers in the region drained by the Mississippi. All that information culminated in their publication of this wonderful map. The revised longitude of the Mississippi Delta shown on the on Delisle 1703 map is affirmed in the 1718 map, but now with vastly greater detail. Elaborated by this inset map you see on the right, Delisle obtained the coastal uh, detail from a manuscript map of Monsieur Support, an officer in the French service who served as pilot and map maker. And the incredible manuscript map is in the uh, collection of Arthur Holzheimer. By extending all the rivers that drain into the Mississippi further north, west, and east, the map maker is clearly trying to illustrate a much greater area to come under the domain of the French authorities. He enlarges French territory to reach from the Rio Grande to the Appalachian Mountains. The Spanish holdings in Florida are particularly squeezed. Neither the English nor the Spanish were amused. With this map, a certain cartographic territorial war is set off, during which map makers from each major power produce charts that exaggerate their holdings. The English would promptly rebut in 1720 with a map by Herman Mull showing the interior of North America and specifically illustrating, almost mocking, the claims of France in De Lille's 1718 map. Professor Susan Schulten points out, and I quote from her book, the conflict between the French and the British was rooted in opposing views of territorial sovereignty. The French claimed that the explorations of La Salle, by La Salle of the Mississippi River gave them rights not only to the river, but also to its tributaries. Conversely, the British asserted that the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 awarded them control of the same region via their relationship with the Iroquois." Close quote. Now, because the French occupation in this vast land was minuscule, De Leo attempted to demonstrate French footprints in the form of prior French explorations. The map is centered on the Mississippi River, claimed by La Salle for the French in 1682. The route of Frenchman Jacques de Saint Denis across Texas as far as the Rio Grande and then back to the Mississippi from 1713 to 1716 is detailed. Natchitoches, founded by Saint-Denis, is prominently marked on the Red River, with text noting that the French fort was established by Sieur de Bienville in 1717. Bienville founded New Orleans in December of 1718, a feature prominently placed on all subsequent printings of Delisle's map of Louisiana, but not on my copy that you see because it's the rare first state printed before uh, Delisle was, uh, before New Orleans was founded. The route of Spaniard Hernando de Soto in 1539 and 1540 is clearly marked across the Southeast and up to the Appalachian Mountains to support 
earlier Spanish ownership of the territory as opposed to British that was subsequently lawfully transferred to the French through treaty. Its mapping of Texas and its complex rivers is a great improvement over all prior published maps. And once again, Delisle shows that he is at the cutting edge of map making. Note the reference to Mission de, la, de los Tejos established in 1716. The reference to Mission de los Te, uh, to the Spanish missions in East Texas uh, is the earliest such, such mention. This notation is the first time that a form of the place named Texas appears on a map. This map, uh, is, this map is the first accurate depiction of the lower reaches of the Arkansas and Red Rivers as they join the Mississippi. Delisle shows the Missouri as a tributary of major size whose confluence with the Missouri is close to accurate. Further up the Missouri, the outlets of the Kansas River and the Platte River are shown for the first time as a result of Sieur de Bergmont's 1714 expedition up the Missouri as far north as the Platte River. Further up river is a legend as translated, and you see it in the little box, quote, the French have only ascended the Missouri this far. Now to the left, the Missouri is shown ascending, in speculation, is shown ascending northwestward to the western edge of the map. In, seven, in 1673, seeing the heavy flow of the Missouri entering the Mississippi, Marquette <coughs> remarked, and I quote, I hope by means of it to make the discovery of the Vermilion Sea and California, close quote. So 45 years later, there was still a strong conviction among map makers that there must be some waterway across the continent or at most uh, only a very short portage between a great eastward draining river and one that emptied into the Pacific. So in this map, Delisle does his part to uphold this hope. Now the legend uh, under the underline here, uh, names the westward extension, the Missouri or the river large. Now the term large may be a reference to Baron Lahontan's River Lawn on this map printed in 1703. Now note the series of lakes in an expanded huge river flowing due east from a range of high mountains, the other side of which connected to the Pacific. However, DeLeo is only hinting by his use of the term large and refrains from showing Lanton's river, uh, massive river body. Although DeLeo's map of Canada produced in 1703 illustrated Lanton's river line to its full extent, by 1718, when this map is produced, DeLeo has his doubts. Now, one of the most curious features of this map is the extremely elongated Rio Grande. Although the latitude of Taos and Santa Fe are only slightly north of their correct position, the Rio Grande extends north to the 45th parallel into the present state of Montana, rather than in Southern Colorado, where it should be. It, there, it therefore almost touches the Missouri River at the northwestern corner of the map. Now recall that on the map made by DeLeo in 1700, the headwaters of the Rio Grande in the Missouri, or the Pe Pe Pecatononi, as it was called, were very close. But then on the map made in 1703, DeLeo moves the Missouri far to the northwest, and the headwaters of the Rio Grande remain in the south. So why did DeLeo create this new fallacious arrangement that brings the rivers together? A manuscript map by Father Francois Lemaire that was returned to France in late 1717 or early 1718 contained this image of an elongated Rio Grande. 
It has been lost, unfortunately, the manuscript's been lost, but it was copied by Sierra Vermali, a French cavalry officer responsible for preparing maps for the, of, of the colonies, whose manuscript does survive. The manuscript contains this faulty configuration, plus new detail about Indian tribes in the Northwest. Assuming the fresh information correct, DeLeo copied Le Maire's image of the extended Rio Grande. Now, Vermali's manuscript map locates many of the known landmarks of New Mexico far too far north of the Rio, on the Rio Grande, presumably as Le Maire drew them. For example, Acoma and a reference to Cibola are depicted in what would be today's Colorado. But DeLeo wisely places these landmarks further south where they belong. But he still greatly exaggerates the headwaters of the Rio Grande with no place name along the way to north of the 45th parallel. So why was DeLeo so easily convinced? Well, for a considerable period, the French believed that the great Western river, which became known as the Missouri, must drain from the mountains near the headwaters of the Rio Grande. This was amply illustrated on the maps of La Salle, Hennepin, and Franklin. If the Missouri went farther, went much farther to the north, well, so must the Rio Grande, and therefore it was stretched north seven additional degrees of latitude. Le Maire states in a 1717 memoir in translation, and I quote, the sources of the Missouri are still unknown, but there are strong reasons to believe that they are not far from the place where the Rio Grande leaves the Missouri, close quote. So a roughly translated legend in the top left, you see that legend uh, indicates, and I quote, near this place, according to the Indian reports, the Spanish ford the Missouri on horseback going to trade with nations located toward the Northwest whence they bring back yellow iron, close quote. <clears throat> now the placement of this legend seems strange because it is placed too far on the map, too far north on the map to connect with the Spaniards. But if the legend relates to the headwaters of the Rio Grande, which it's also next to, where the Spaniards were fording the nearby Arizona or Arkansas or Platte rivers northwest to trade gold, well, then this Indian legend would make sense, provided that the Rio Grande's headwaters were correctly located. Now, although containing errors, DeLille's 1718 map is a great leap forward. So let me wrap this up for you. Why were the DeLille's maps so good? Well, just as in sports and business, success breeds success. As brilliant and exacting technicians, the DeLille's received renown. This led them to the inner circle of French geography, having early access to all the reports from French explorers and New World officials. And it was the French who were where the action was at this time in the New World. One source was especially important. In June 1706, Francois Le Maire arrived in Louisiana. Now there is no known image of Francois Le Maire. So I'm showing you an image of a Dutchman a hundred years earlier named Jacques Le Maire in hopes that it will inspire you to help me find an image of Francois Le Maire. Now Francois's reports indicate that this secular priest unassociated with any order had become disillusioned with saving souls but was fascinated with the political affairs, the science and the geography of Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. Le Maire was a keen observer, talented geographer and a sly recipient of French and Spanish information. He formed a trusted bond with Father Jean Bobet, a well-connected priest in Versailles. Le Maire sent back detailed relations and maps again and again that were shared with the Delilles until 1719, when he finally left Louisiana. 
So armed with Lemaire's manuscript maps and reports and those of many others, the Delilles applied their judgment in the preparation of their great map of Louisiana for publication in June, 1718. In the map's title block, Delil explains that his map is based on many New World sources, but singles out only one for special mention, Father Lemaire. The Delil map revolutionized the understanding of North America, and in tribute, the king created a special title for Guillaume, for Guillaume Premier, Premier Geographe du Roi. In conclusion, this map had enormous influence in serving as the benchmark map of the interior West into the final decades of the 18th century. During the first quarter of the 18th century, the Delisle family dominated the field among European map makers. So surely the Delisles delivered a tour de force of cartographic expression. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Wes. Fantastic presentation. So let's let the questions begin. Uh, you're, feel free to put them on, your, on the chat room. I'm um, going to, shall I leave this and go back to the images where we can happily see everybody's faces? Sure, let's stop do that. Sharing. So I will try to stop sharing. Yes. Stop share. There we go. There you go. There we go. So we'll start with the ones in the chat room and then we can open it up later. So we got Mary Vandrak saying, why is Florida so inaccurate on the 1718 map? I knew you'd open with a question. I have no idea how to answer. Surely someone in this room, I do know uh, that the area of uh, west of Florida was very highly carefully surveyed uh, by the Spanish, by Supart. And uh, so if you look to the west, once you go to the north edge of uh, where Florida makes its turn, from that point to the Mississippi, it's very accurately, accurately charted. Uh, but we do have some people possibly, uh, Dorothy uh, Raffelli, I see her face, she's a Floridian. Maybe she can answer this question. <laughs> She's just smiling and nodding no. Okay, any <laughs> other volunteers? Well, we'll go on to the next question. All right. <laughs> oh, well, I stumped the person. Okay, Patrick uh, McGranahan says, that Kino map is from a Jesuit collection? Yes, it is from a Jesuit collection uh, being written about by an author who's going, who has permission to come out with it in a very important book in the next year. And so, I promised them that I would not reproduce this map other than in a presentation. So please don't uh, do anything with that image. She, she worked very hard to get special permission from the Jesuit authorities uh, to get that manuscript map. Oh, can wait, says Patrick. <laughs> have to wait. <laughs> good, good, good. All right. Uh, let's see, I don't see anyone in the chat. So anybody that wants to jump in and unmute yourself and have a question? You're free to do that. I'll just I'll just give a plug for Marilla Altec, Professor Marilla Altec from Croatia, is a tremendous, the probably the greatest authority on Jesuit mapping, and she's coming out with a grand, spectacular book representing decades of work, and that that among many others uh, will be illustrated for the first time. Yeah, they definitely map that region. Um, let's see, anybody? Uh, will a recording of this presentation be posted? Yes, indeed. As soon as we're done, we'll, uh, we'll post it on our website. Um, let's see. One question, Wes. Um, what happened after, was there any, any descendants from the Delils that, the, the Lils that kept going or you stopped with the two? Oh no, there were several Delils. His wife, when, when uh, uh, Guillaume uh, died, his wife took over. Then his uh, 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 brother uh, was also very active. He went to, I'm trying to remember if Don McGurk is on, he will remember his name. He went to Russia and uh, was an expert for the Russian government doing, uh, government doing mapping and sending this map information back uh, to his brother, uh, in, in Paris, 
and then uh, his son and uh, his uh, son-in-law, uh, uh, Buash, Philip Buash, uh, became a very prominent map maker, continuing uh, using the Delio plates, and they were finally uh, ended in like the 1770s uh, or so. And and the map is there are there are lots of little tweaks to the Louisiana map, and new information comes out. But the map really is not surpassed until about 1780s. It's just an extraordinary uh, leap forward in, in the history of cartography. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Dave Kennard. What cartographer brought the source of the Rio Grande back south? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. So all the map makers in the 1700s uh, pretty much co uh, copy this. Uh, but by about 17, uh, let's see, 1768, uh, my favorite, uh, uh, Alzate y Ramirez, uh, produces a map that shows the Rio Grande brought back down. Uh, it was not widely followed, but several others starting in about the 1770s bring the, bring the Rio Grande back down to earth back down to New Mexico and Colorado where it belongs. So Coronelli had it right. And then uh, it was, and then it was not until Alzate probably that he came back. Well, what's so strange is, is DeLeo had it right. He had it right on his 1703 map. And then he changed his mind and moved it way up to the North. Mm -hmm. And, and I had, I've struggled forever to try to figure out what explains this crazy Rio Grande. Of course, he had such authority that everybody naturally followed uh, DeLeo for many decades and assumed that that was correct. Okay. Let me ask another one. Who, after the Lills, who filled that void, or or that just went into different directions? The Spaniards and the uh, the British, or somebody else. Who who? It was not until Humboldt that this was. Well, uh, there were many map makers who who filled the void. Now now Nicholas de Fur was a, a renowned co a contemporary of Delil. Mm -hmm. He also came out with very important maps. And he was privy to some of these same uh, manuscripts and, and journals coming back. He had a key map in 1701 and also a key map in 1718, but it was never quite at the level uh, that the, the Delilles were, at least in my opinion. And it's my paper, so you're stuck with this interpretation uh, tonight. Uh, and then many others started filling the void uh, later in the mid, uh, mid 1700s. Mm -hmm. Question from uh, Louis Kennedy. The Great Lakes region accuracy seemed to follow the Mississippi accuracy. Did commerce drive accuracy? Commerce? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the, uh, you know, the quest for money, uh, which was driving the French up the St. Lawrence and into the Great Lakes and, and to the West and even South from there, it was that quest of commerce uh, that was driving this. And uh, I'm sure we have other experts on the, on the line that could speak uh, more thoughtfully about the mapping of the Great Lakes. Okay. If Hart Holzheimer is on the line. He's a real authority on that one. Okay. Question here says, could the tension, maybe probably the extension of the Rio Grande be a mistaken report of the plat? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting theory. Uh, the, I've studied the manuscript by Lemaire, uh, or Lemaire by Vermale, uh, and it shows a, a separate plat, which is sort of the uh, conception of the Missouri at that particular moment. The upper Missouri was not known. Uh, the, the Missouri was only surveyed, or not even surveyed, but traveled uh, as far north as the plat at the time that this map was made. So I doubt that that is the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. And but somehow some kind of fallacious information uh, got back to the folks uh, down at the bottom of the Mississippi River and made its way back over with Lemaire. Uh, Lemaire wasn't going out and doing the exploration. He was receiving all this data and interviewing all these people as they came in from the hinterland. Uh, 
But I do think a part of it was simply the desire, the belief that of course the Rio Grande and the Missouri had to come together. And nobody had been to the headwaters of the Rio Grande at that time. Nobody had been to the, uh, at least among the European map makers, certainly native per persons had. And nobody had been to the headwaters of the Missouri at that point. Okay. Also about the Rio Grande, Dave Kennard says, was the little misplacement of the Rio Grande headwaters part of the stovepipe claim of Texas later? Uh, no, that's a complete, the Rio Grande gets moved down to size uh, long before the stovepipe gets uh, erected, yeah. uh, which would have been in the 17, uh, 1830s and, and 40s uh, in that period. Mm -hmm. Probably in the 1840s. I'm not sure if the stovepipe itself uh, was, was shown until the early 1840s until 1846, I think. Okay. Chris Lane says some of it likely had to do with the idea of the height of land in the middle of America, which was the source of the Rio Grande, the Mississippi, the St. Lawrence, and Colorado. So, and then lots of thanks. Wes, thank you very much. Great research. Uh, somebody else's excellent talk, Wes. And I guess we can join everybody with a big applause in any way we can. There you go. Thank you for your attention tonight. It was lots of fun and great fun to see many friends and smiling faces in the audience. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to the paper, please. That's a point. <laughs>